grab some coffee, grab some tea, and get ready for story time with a nice blankie because it is raining out, um, dark because there's no light outside, and we're gonna talk about some, uh, some things about deodorant. Found a pussy in a dollar bin. Guess you forgot your galana bin. Can't get it loose. Get to God's got your tongue again. Hey, you beautiful people. Welcome back to Eco-ish, where you join me on my journey and learning how to live more sustainably. Today we're going to talk about what's in your deodorant and the down and dirty of all that fun stuff. First, first things first, a disclaimer, and you've probably heard this in many videos before, and this will not be the first time. Um, this is just my opinion. I'm not a scientist. I'm, in case you aren't aware, I'm a third year sustainability student on track to graduate in another semester. But like I said, I'm in no way a scientist. I'm not a chemist. I'm not a biologist. I just study sustainability. My sources will be in the description box below. I encourage you to fact check me. I encourage you to do your own research and check those out. But I feel like the way I've approached this video is a bit more comprehensive than some other videos I've seen in the past. I'm going to be talking about the ingredients in conventional deodorant and the possibilities uh, that those can cause. I'm also going to talk about um, a little bit about the FDA. I'm also going to talk about the ingredients that are in natural deodorant. I'm going to talk about baking soda and why it may not be good. I'm going to talk about what ingredients to look for in a natural deodorant and then just some suggestions at the very end of what types of natural deodorants you can try. Something to remember when I talk about products that maybe can cause cancer and I'll address this again later is the science around cancer has not been conclusive. A lot of these ingredients may cause cancer but have not been proven to cause cancer. It takes a lot of years and a lot of research and a lot of funding to prove that something causes cancer um, just because we still don't fully understand it and there's so many factors that go into it. So like I said the best thing you can do is to take everything I say and everything someone else says even scientists with a grain of salt and do your own research and look at all the different studies and form your own opinion and that's the best thing to do for yourself. And if one ingredient works for you, so be it. Something that works for one person might not work for another and something that doesn't work for you might work for someone else. So let's start with the basics. The difference between deodorant and antiperspirants. I'll be honest, I was never familiar with the term antiperspirant until recently. I may have used an antiperspirant in my life, but it wasn't something I was aware existed. So antiperspirants pretty much look the same as a deodorant. It's something that almost every conventional deodorant brand has. So Secret might offer one antiperspirant and 50 other deodorants. Old Spice offers maybe one or two antiperspirants and again, 50 other deodorants. Um, an antiperspirant works by blocking the sweat ducts in your armpit so that you don't produce sweat or it doesn't come out. So the thing with that is your body, the purpose of sweating is to regulate your body temperature. And you may hear, and I may have said it in my last video, not knowing um, until I knew better, your body doesn't sweat out toxins. Your body can release the toxins and it goes and gets filtered out through like your liver and your kidney, but your body doesn't sweat out toxins. It doesn't have that ability. So your body only sweats to regulate temperature, but by blocking that sweat, you somewhat impede that ability. So it's something to be aware of. But there are people who sweat excessively and may need an antiperspirant. And I will say now, you're really not going to find a good antiperspirant, if any, with natural deodorant. The crystal deodorant, which I'll mention a little bit more later, might work that way because it works by clogging the pores, but I don't know for sure. There really is no marketed natural antiperspirant. It just doesn't exist. Now, the thing with sweating that causes the odor is there's bacteria on your skin. This bacteria 
protects your skin from pathogens, but it also causes odor by eating the sweat. So when you block the sweat, you prevent the bacteria from eating it. The way a deodorant works is it prevents this bacteria to begin with. So on your skin is this bacteria or a microbe. And these microbes, like I said, create body odor, but they're also protecting you from pathogens. Research has shown that antiperspirants can actually kill the microbes on the skin. I don't know if that was the intent of an antiperspirant, because like I said, they're more meant to block the sweat, but they, have, they can kill the microbes on your skin. However, when you stop using the antiperspirant, it has shown that the microbes do come back. So they're not gone forever. So it's not like you ruined your body or something. There's three different kinds of microbes that they've found in our underarms. And there's like these ones that are neither neutral nor bad. But there's also the ones that eat the sweat, protect from pathogens, and create odor. People who never used underarm products tended to have the ones that created odor. People who used products tended to have the microbes that were neither good nor bad. They just didn't really do anything. There's not much practical use for this information, but it was pretty much the only study done on these microbes, and there's still plenty of room for people to research it more. So now that we generally understand what's up with armpits and why they stink, what's in our deodorant that actually does the work? what's killing those microbes, and what's keeping us from sweating. So first I'm going to talk about parabens. Parabens are a type of preservative found in many different personal care products, but they're actually not that common in most popular deodorant brands. But the reason I'm going to talk about it is because it is still in some deodorant. It still exists, so it's still important to talk about. The thing with parabens is they interfere with estrogen production, and can be a carcinogenic, so they can possibly cause cancer. Parabens can mimic the activity of estrogen and have been found in breast tumors, and that's why they think it's possible it causes cancer, because they have found parabens in the tumors. However, an even more important ingredient is aluminum salts. So aluminum salts are used in antiperspirants to plug the sweat ducts. So aluminum salts have been proven to cause dementia and bone disease in people with kidney disease on dialysis. So if your kidneys are functioning at less than 30%, then you are at serious risk if you use aluminum salts. Sorry, I have my laptop here, by the way, and I'm just trying to make sure I get all the facts correct so that I'm not giving you bad information. And like I said, I'll leave all my sources in the, in the description box, and I'll organize them by um, what they're talking about. I'm not going to cite them because it's difficult for you to find them later. I'm just going to kind of categorize them for you. So some studies suggest that aluminum salts can cause gene instability in breast tissue, leading to tumors. 50% of breast cancers start in the upper outer quadrant of the breast around the underarm region which is why they believe that aluminum salts can cause cancer because they have found that cancer in the breast tends to start in this re region. So that's very close to where you're putting deodorant on. So something in the deodorant could be causing this. Irritation and chemical burns are more important things to worry about short term. So be aware if you're shaving before you put deodorant on, you're opening those pores, you're like ripping them open, and then if you put anything on that, anything in that product is going to be absorbed by your skin very easily. So if you have sensitive skin at all, you should not be putting any product on after shaving. You're going to end up with irritation, you could end up with chemical burns from the aluminum salts or baking soda. That is something to just be aware of. The next ingredient I'm going to talk about has some environmental effects as well. Triclosan is used in products such as anti-acne products to kill bacteria. It's very effective in killing bacteria. 75% of Americans have detectable levels of triclosan in their urine. So it does stick around for a while. It is a known endocrine disruptor. It can cause tumors and developmental disorders in children. Children with a prolonged exposure to triclosan have a higher chance of allergies such as peanut allergies and hay fever due to reduced exposure to bacteria when their immune system is developing. So 
children, sh the, a lot of the reason, and then there's a few things that have been banned in this list due to children. When children are young, they're very, they're easily affected by things. A, qu a small quantity of a chemical that might not affect us could affect them way worse because they're still developing. That's the same reason why a child doesn't drink alcohol or smoke. There is an increased risk of breast cancer in those people exposed to it. The FDA has banned it in soaps, so they've acknowledged some risk involved with the with the ingredient, but they have not banned it in deodorants and antiperspirants because of its effectiveness. Environmentally, it's bad as well. It can disrupt algae's ability to perform photosynthesis, and it also builds up in the fatty tissues of fish, which you end up eating. Going into fragrances, we have phthalates are the first thing I'm going to talk about. So phthalates extend the life of a fragrance and it's what makes it stick to your skin. I don't know if any of you have ever had like a fragrance that you spray on your skin and you swear an hour later you can't smell it anymore. So those higher quality perfumes tend to have phthalates in them to keep them sticking to your skin longer. That way they don't just dissipate and you don't smell them anymore. Phthalates are a known endocrine disruptor. They can affect testosterone production, which can impair reproductive ability in men. So in 2005, the first study on phthalates showed that male babies born to women with high level of phthalates showed low sperm count, undescended testicles, and other reproductive problems. In women, it can affect fetal development in those who are pregnant. High concentrations of phthalates in utero leads to lower IQ and increased risk of asthma. So if you are pregnant and you are putting phthalates on your body, it is very possible it's going to affect your child. In women in general, it can cause early onset puberty, which is associated with breast cancer and later life. So some studies link phthalates to liver and kidney cancer, but yet again, there are conflicting studies when it comes to this. And the European Union has banned phthalates in toys and other products for these exact reasons. But they did not ban it in deodorant and antiperspirants, and the U.S. has not banned it, period. Now, fragrances themselves have issues not associated with, like, phthalates. So, fragrances are considered trade secrets, and they don't have to disclose all the ingredients. Um, that's an issue, you know. As a consumer... Don't we have a right to know what's in these products? How are we supposed to know if what we're putting on our body is bad if we don't even know what's in it? Who's checking these companies? How are they being audited, essentially, to make sure that what they're putting in is safe if we can't even see what's going into it? And in case you aren't a history buff, the FDA is the Food and Drug Administration. Their sole goal is to keep us healthy and to make sure nothing harmful is put into the market. However, with that in mind, the FDA does not ban something unless it's proven harmful. And I'm not going to say the FDA is at fault for these things because you're never going to know what's bad until it's too late. Um, but you want to be a conscious consumer and you want to make sure you're doing your own research and not just blindly listening to things that people tell you. So another consequence of deodorant is plastic. So there's two things about plastic that I'll just cover real quick is 8% of the world's oil production goes into making plastic. So if you weren't aware before, oil does make plastic. And if you haven't seen it in the news yet, the second thing is microplastics are in our water and in our fish. So Basically, what's happening is plastic is shedding fibers, and these fibers are getting in the water system. One investigation showed that 94% of tap water samples from the U.S. had microplastics in them. That's water you're drinking. I don't know how much more to say about that. Just kind of something you just need to know. That's all the ingredients in conventional deodorant that I'm going to talk about. But just because conventional deodorant has bad ingredients doesn't always mean that natural deodorants are perfect. So one important thing about natural deodorant is baking soda. 
So you can tell if an ingredient is an active ingredient if it's at the top of the list. So typically you're not going to want a natural deodorant with baking soda at the very top of the list because there's a few things it can do. Baking soda is basic, whereas your skin is acidic. I'm talking about pH levels. And the bacteria on your skin prefers a basic environment, so you shouldn't cater to that. So when you put baking soda on, you're actually making the issue worse. It also affects the skin's barrier when it's an active ingredient. Um, it can neutralize odor, but in turn it can cause irritation, breakouts, and infection when it harms that layer. And typically this happens more in people with sensitive skin. So for some people it might work amazing. For some people it might be the worst thing in the world and cause like a burn in your armpit. So what, what should you look for? So the few ingredients I found that seem to do well in a natural deodorant. First was certain essential oils. So lemongrass, eucalyptus, peppermint, and orange oils are considered antibacterial. You can also use an astringent like witch hazel, which will dry out the underarms and reduce the pore size so you're not sweating as much. Another product you can use is arrowroot powder, and it's a good alternative to baking soda because it absorbs moisture on the skin, and that's in most natural uh, deodorants. Some alternatives two conventional deodorant that you can use include the crystal deodorant which is basically a natural salt block that that goes into the pores and blocks your pores you can also use natural deodorant such as the one from meow meow tweet that i reviewed you can also use uh there's a brand called hippie pits that comes in like a little tin container so you could use that one that's recyclable there's also Ethique, which I'm going to be reviewing hopefully next week or the week after, and that one is a bar. If you're not ready to go natural, you can always find a conventional aluminum-free deodorant. I'm currently doing research on natural deodorants. I'm trying to make a huge list of all the different natural deodorants, and I'm organizing them by ones with recyclable, compostable, biodegradable packaging versus those with plastic. And I'm not going to review a single deodorant with plastic. So I'm trying to find the best of the best eco-friendly deodorants and I will be reviewing all of them. Keep an eye out for my next video. The Ethique review should be coming soon. And I will be making a video about natural deodorants in the future. So I hope you stick around till then. In the meanwhile, like, subscribe, hit the notification button because subscribe button doesn't do much anymore and I hope to see you in my next video bye guys stand by your side through all of the lives watching you cry